Welcome back into the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you, a Wednesday edition. As uh, typically we get together on Wednesday and go over what Chris Kleiman had to say in the middle of the week at his press conference, go over the ins and outs of all of that. But it's really simple this week coming off of the loss against Missouri. It's number one about all the guys that are banged up and then really number two about how this team is ready and willing to respond after losing that game to Missouri, which obviously the players aren't very excited about how it played out. But Chris Kleiman said, hey, we, we can't let Missouri beat us twice, and we'll see where it goes from there. You know, that's great in theory, but uh, if you have all these injuries that are starting to mount up to guys that are impactful to your success, uh, it may not even be in your control if the Missouri game beats you twice. It may be that Missouri beats you twice because you're battered from it, uh, and you could do nothing about that. So uh, a lot of this is going to be heavily focused on the guys that are out and injured. Daniel Green, that one we we kind of assumed going into yesterday based off of some things that D.Y. had heard, and then uh, we, Chris Kleiman confirmed it. So if you haven't, go and check out the KSO video we have up currently, uh, kind of breaking down Daniel Green's season-ending injury and uh, just kind of where K-State goes from there and how the linebacker situation plays out because it does change things. I mean, Austin Romain, a true freshman, is listed as the starter at Mike Linebacker this week. They are still without Jake Clifton for at least this week. Then they hit the bye week. Then they'll be down in Stillwater, so maybe he'll be back by then. Uh, but, you know, this K-State team is already missing one of their key linebackers. Now they lose a starter, a guy that's been in the program for six years. One of the other injury updates that we got on Tuesday was that Treshawn Ward was doubtful in the words of Chris Kleiman. Um that was kind of a different one because I'm not sure any of us kind of had that on our radar heading into yesterday. And all of a sudden, Chris Kleiman, he he popped that one off uh, pretty early and everything, saying that Treshawn Ward was doubtful. And then the big one, Will Howard, uh, questionable was the words that Chris Kleiman used. He was obviously really banged up in the game against Missouri, uh, was struggling to move. K-State would have liked to have probably run him a little bit more. Um you just kind of lose the the element of surprise with Will Howard if he can't run the ball, and especially if you try it, he's he's already not the fastest of guys. So Chris Kleiman kind of made note of that yesterday, but when he is hobbled, he certainly has a tougher time getting away from dudes that can bring him down. Uh, and we saw Avery Johnson be heavily used in the the quarterback run game and really the run game in general. Uh, K State running backs only got 19 carries in the game against Missouri, so a lot to get to on the injury front because. Really, that was the only thing that stood out yesterday. We didn't see a ton of players in there. I think, what, five players total yesterday in the the hour that they're normally made available. Um, obviously, a lot of that has to do with the fact that, you know, three of the guys that could have been in there were were injured in Daniel Green, Trayshawn Ward, and Will Howard, and then conflicting schedules and everything else. And it's just a, a, a tough day yesterday. So injuries are the main topic here. Um, but we'll, we'll dive into the Will Howard and Avery Johnson thing pretty heavily uh, to start DY, but first uh, offer up some thoughts on Treshawn Ward and, and how that might impact K-State if at all, if, if he can't go on Saturday. Yeah. I mean, you lose one of your you know playmakers at the skill positions on offense when you already are kind of down one, so to speak with Keegan Johnson, not being 100% and really yet to take off this year. So you become a little bit easier to game play for because you don't have to worry about him as much if he's not in there. But, you know, Coach Kleiman mentioned LaJames White, mentioned Jordan Skippers, not necessarily Joe Jackson, the true freshman. So from what I gather on that is with, with the bye week ahead, you'll see a lot of DJ Giddens. Yeah, I mean, th this is what it, probably what the, the offense would have looked like if – the case that had not landed Treshawn Ward. If you know, if it was DJ Giddens and everybody else, it would have looked probably pretty similar to to the running back split that was there last year, although even lesser because Deuce Vaughn at least had DJ Giddens behind him. Uh, you know, the, the run game has not been incredibly effective for K State, so I don't know that it impacts it from that standpoint where you feel like, oh wow, you're losing you know this specific amount of yardage or production in a game, but you are losing a guy that can be explosive and at times has shown that he can make a play or two for K-State. And that obviously hurts when you're coming off of a loss and, and need everything at your disposal for this game. But, you know, that that's that's one thing, at least for K-State, the good news is you have a guy in DJ Giddens that is still a very, very good running back, especially 
you know, in, in the Big 12. So it, it shouldn't be that alarming. Now, the important thing and probably what everybody is most concerned about is the news with Will Howard and, and what's going on there. Questionable was the term that Chris Kleiman used. The way I tend to lean is that when a coach is that upfront about things, it's probably even worse than what he is, you know, kind of leading on to. Um, you know, Chris Kleiman coming out, not even being asked about Will Howard, just saying it in the opening statement that Howard was questionable, pairing that with what we saw from Will Howard. Uh, it makes me think that he's he is in some seriously rough shape and that there's a legitimate chance that that Avery Johnson is the starting quarterback on Saturday. Um, but that's that's just a lot of inferring and in, based off of years of kind of watching how guys handle this and, and how things kind of operate. So where do you see the the quarterback situation before we kind of dive into what it would mean if Will Howard is limited or can't go? Yeah, I mean, that's quality speculation. Even when you look back on the track record of Chris Kleiman, he tends to be overly cautious. Although, I mean, there's times where he says Skylar Thompson is questionable and he's actually out, you know, for multiple weeks or the rest of the season in one case. So he typically plays it closer to the vest when it comes to the quarterback position. Him coming out and saying questionable, it's easy to jump to that conclusion that maybe we, they won't have Will Howard this week. What I will say is that the nature of this injury is that it can be improved with a few days of recovery and a few days of rest. So I think questionable is actually a probably accurate portrayal based on what I am hearing um, is kind of unfolding at the moment. I wouldn't say it's a slam dunk either way that Will Howard will play or that he won't play. I would say that right now it's up in the air and there's still time left in the week for him to make enough progress to be the guy. With that being said, um, my takeaway is that we will probably see Avery Johnson even more than we did against Missouri, but I'm not sure he's going to be the guy. Well, so if you know if that's if that's the situation where there's going to be a mix of the two guys, how, how if you're K State, do you make it to where you have an efficient day offensively, and how it how it actually makes sense to still get Will Howard in there, even if you have to use Avery Johnson more because I, I think at some point, like if Avery Johnson is going to play a lot more, it cannot be in the capacity of when he's in there, it's a run. Like that, that becomes easier for teams to kind of deal with. And also you're just going to have to trust, like let him try and make some plays with his arm too. So how, how would you handle that? And, and I mean, how difficult does that make it for K-State? Yeah, that, that's two things there. One is that you, you got to be careful not to be predictable. It can't be, oh, Will Howard's in the game. You're going to throw the ball. Avery Johnson's in the game. You're going to run the ball. That's a very good um, observation, and that's something that they're going to have to look hard into and try to steer clear from being that predictable because that's going to be a big element if they are both indeed going to play this week. What I will say is that means you do have to throw with Avery, but they're probably not going to be able to run with Will. So you're going to need Avery Johnson for the quarterback run game if that's – um, a, a component that you need to be able to run the ball. If you can't have the traditional run game like you didn't have against Missouri, then you might need the quarterback run game. In that case, it could become a lot of Avery Johnson, but while doing so, him also being able uh, to throw it as well. Also, if you're going to a 2QB system, and I'm not even saying this is – it's the wrong, uh, wrong uh, answer, wrong way to go, um, because thus far with the – two QB system. Now we only saw it in game one and then again in game three and on a very tempered level, mm -hmm. but you got to be careful to not disrupt the rhythm. Um, if a guy's really, really going, I think you stick with him. If a guy's not, then I think um, then you're more accept receptive to the two QB idea. So almost a little bit of a hot hand there. I just wouldn't take out a guy that's doing really well. Like one of the things I didn't, Love last week, and, and obviously this is not – I'm not saying these coaches are not doing the right things. They have their reasons and justification. But one was, you know, Will Howard on the field when Avery Johnson was at quarterback. Didn't necessarily understand that. And number two, um, a little bit uh, – and I almost lost my tra train of thought here, actually, would also bother me. But th those are things that within the game I didn't like. Um you're going 10 on 11 if Will Howard's at wide receiver when Avery Johnson's your quarterback, especially 
when he is banged up. So those are just things. And don't take Avery out on third down, right? Um, if he's the one, if he's the reason they got yeah. you to third and short, at least give him a shot to see if he can um, make things happen on third and short. Never getting one chance. Didn't love that. Just thought what else? Uh, what else I was? What else I was going to say is that first drive they scored that touchdown against Missouri. Things kind of operated pretty well. Um, stalled a little bit in the red zone. Got some good fortune mm-hmm. on the Philip Brooks tip touchdown catch. Come back to second drive, even though you were doing really good with the success rate. A couple, a couple of chunk plays come back. Your offensive line actually looked pretty solid as well. Come back second drive. Carver Willis is not a game of right tackle. You move BB yeah. out to right tackle. Maybe I didn't see something, but I didn't think Carver Willis was um, needing to re- be replaced at that moment. So just, I don't want to see substitute just for the sake of substitution. Not that they didn't. Not that they did that. Maybe I wasn't seeing something there with Carver Willis, but. Uh, yeah, a little less rotation, um, and and not not rotating if it's not necessary because rhythm for the offense as a whole is pretty important, especially along the offensive line. Well, I think it's I think it's a situation where you have to be you know you have to go into every game with a a roadmap, a game plan. Like, okay, we anticipate the game to play out this way, so here is how we should do it if that happens. And my assumption would be that like they knew that at some point on the first drive they said if we get inside the the 15 or whatever Avery's going in and we're going to try and use his legs because he could make a play happen for us and break one and the way the run game had been working that will happen so they did try that what it was they bring him in on a second down I think I think it was in between the first down and then the third down touchdown pass to Brooks I mean, it was clear because I think all of Avery's carries and times he went on, went on the field to make stuff happen was kind of like in second and long. And, and yeah, you know, Curry Sexton said this on the Three Mall podcast, and it's true. This is how you you do it. This is how you game plan during the week and how you prepare during the week. But you do have a second down package. You do have a third down package, um, and you go in it to it with that plan. So, whatever it may be, my guess is that all these third down plays that they really liked for that week, it probably didn't include. Avery Johnson being a part of it. Um, and that's fair. But once the game started to unfold after a few times, I think abandoning from that just a little bit and having a little bit more of an open mind. But then again, maybe Avery's not comfortable with some of those plays that yeah. you needed to run on third down. I don't know. Well, and I and you know that that's just what I was gonna get to and say is you have to go in with this thing that that you have planned yep. in your head, you have to have contingencies ready to go, but also just be understanding of the moment and the situation. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's a debate in all sports now, but it's probably more so prevalent in baseball and the way things operate is because it was for such a long time. It was just a sport based on feel and, and how the manager felt the game was going and what guy he felt like was going to be effective in this moment or which guy was going to be able to go up to the plate and deliver where, you know, you bring a lefty in to, to pitch, they're going to pinch hit, send a righty to the plate even if, you know, 30, 40 years ago, the splits would have told you, you could have probably looked and it's like, well, actually this righty sucks against lefties. And the lefty you just pulled, like he's hitting 320 off lefties this year. They weren't looking at that stuff 40 years ago. But now it's like the total opposite where the numbers and, and all that dictates how you do things. So you go into a game, this is your plan. It's like a computer spit out what you're going to do. And very rarely does it seem like the manager has the leeway to kind of break away from that. I think in football, and specifically this situation, Chris Kleiman and his staff, they have to be willing to break away from whatever format and system they've decided they've put in place for this game. So whether that has to do with going with the flow of Avery or Willett quarterback this weekend, I think they have to, because I'm with you. Some of the third and short stuff, I think Avery Johnson should have still been in the game for K-State last weekend. I think it probably gives them a better chance to pick up a first down. And that's one of those deals, too, where – I know that it was a tight game, road road SEC team, all this stuff going on, a lot of energy, probably a tough thing to, to ask. But, uh, you know, I, I probably would have, you know, maybe thrown Avery a couple of times there just to, to try and keep him off balance or try and sneak one on him. And I think this week you're going to have to do that if you're Chris Kleiman, where you could go into this thing and say, OK, we're going to we're going to say we'll say Will is playing. He goes out there, he starts the game, and he's, you know, he's in this rhythm. And you had it down. You're like, okay, we were gonna go out there and and stick Avery out there on, you know, the fifth play of the drive, or once we got to this point. 
Will Howard's throwing the ball well. Don't mess with that. Let Will keep going. And then, you know, if you said, hey, the second drive, we were going to start with Avery out there. If Will's playing well, do it. I mean, uh, unless the injury dictates you to do something differently, I think you have to be willing to to jump ship one way or the other. And that can be the total flip side is if, you know, through the first two drives, you're, you're giving Will a go. It's clear that the injury is hurting him. The offense isn't moving the ball. And then Avery Johnson gets out there and does a couple of things. Stick with it. Don't worry about putting Will back in there for this game. Everybody knows that Will Howard is the quarterback of this team. Like what, what happened last year to Adrian Martinez is not going to happen this year to Will Howard. Like it's a, a totally different deal. The, the severity of this injury seems to be a lot more short term than what Martinez's deal was, at least the second time around. And I, I don't think that Chris Kleiman is going to replace Will Howard with Avery Johnson at any point this year because they're obviously confident in what Will Howard can do. But I think you have to at least be honest with the situation on Saturday and be ready to, to kind of abandon ship, no matter which guy is playing well or which guy's playing poorly. You, you just got to you got to let this thing play out. Honestly, you might be better off going into this game knowing how you're you're wanting to play UCF, but not even discussing how you want to to do the split between Howard and Johnson if both guys are going to see the field. I mean, you might know in the back of your head that there needs to be more Avery Johnson in this game to get the run game going if you're Colin Klein, but don't be married to saying, okay, the, the breakdown of snaps needs to be like 50-50 or 65-35. I think you just have to go into this blind and and go with the flow. That I mean, that to me is the the best procedure in all of this. Yeah, probably, and a lot of it will probably depend on health as well. So mm -hmm. that'll be your roadmap. Yeah, the one thing to to, to consider in all of this for you know those that are on, hey, a just let Avery Johnson go. One thing to keep in mind, like it's very clear that the legs and the athleticism are ready to be on a power five football field. There's no doubt about that based on what we've seen through three weeks. The only thing that would be in question is he is a very young guy and quarterback is a very, very tough position to play at any level when you're, you know, breaking in. And that is still the brain of a true freshman quarterback that, you know, that, that could dictate some things in all of this. And uh, it's the, the passing element that might lack. So uh, that's what I'm most interested to see is, is how much they trust Avery Johnson and how he handles the trust that they might give him in this game. If Number one, if he is supposed to be the quarterback for the entirety of the game, if Will Howard can't go, because then obviously he has to throw and it's, you know, the offense opens up a lot more, or even if it's just, you know, limited time and trying to, to get Will Howard off of his feet a little bit. Yeah, I, I reserve the right to be wrong because we haven't seen it enough yet. But Kansas State is a better team if Will Howard is your quarterback still. You have a better chance to win more games if Will Howard is your quarterback. Avery yeah. Johnson has the potential to be probably easily better than Will Howard at some point in his, in his career. That day is not today. You wouldn't think. So Kansas State can win more games this year. If Will Howard is your guy, can stay can also be a better team this year. If Will Howard is your guy, and you can still use Avery Johnson a little bit because there is a part of him that does belong in a football field, power five football field already. I hearken back to this, and I've done it several times, whether it be on a podcast, on a show, or through my you know written pieces this week. Part of the reason why Kansas State lost to Missouri was inexperience in the lack in the back of this, in whether it be in the back half of the defense or elsewhere. Because a lot of, you know, of what they're attributing to the defensive breakdowns were a lack of eye discipline and some errors in communication. Those are the two hallmarks and two symptoms of an inexperienced group. And I said this at some point, there will be growing pains because of that inexperience. And it cropped up against Missouri. People forget about this. Mm -hmm. Kobe Savage started eight games last year. I think he has the most experience of anyone in the secondary. B.J. Payne started four. The other three not started for Kansas State. So between four to five guys are only four career starts. He had zero at corner. That stuff happens. Now, everyone wants to see the most talented player play. I get that. But sometimes there's a trade-off and experience does have, have some value and it's able to prevent some things like the explosive plays on offense from Missouri last week that ultimately probably won them the game. Yeah, no, that's, that's a, a very good point. Basically, you know, the, the some of these young guys, like they can make some really big flashy plays happen and th there's the talent. But 
Um, the, the mental side of the game is going to burn them at times and sometimes burn them a lot more than some of the other guys. And, and it, that experience is eventually going to be good and it's going to be what makes them better mentally down the road. Exactly. But it is one of those deals to, to consider where in the case of Avery Johnson, you know, the talent is obviously there. It's just there will be growing pains. I mean, that's that's something that you have to get figured out. And even though there can be that big it all clicks moment, there will also be a lot of other nasty ones. I mean, I, I think the you know, the kind of the example for all of that is and it's funny that it came up yesterday on 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 the message boards because uh, I had actually independently looked this up yesterday and was kind of going through things and just kind of seeing what was going on. But you can have, you know, both things happen within the same season or really close to each other. You know, like uh, they, the talk on the board yesterday was about when did Josh Freeman take over as quarterback at K-State during his freshman year. And it was uh, – he, he finally came in like – during the Baylor game, and that was an atrocious Baylor game that K-State had. But Josh Freeman in that game was 11 of 33 for, and had three interceptions for K-State. But later that same year, Freeman lit it up against number four Texas, threw for 270 yards, three touchdowns. It was a massive win for K-State. And that's just kind of the evidence that you have where Josh Freeman obviously was an insanely talented quarterback, even as a freshman. But he had a lot of games and a lot of instances where – there were the growing pains and the struggles. Now, part of that was not on him. He had a terrible head coach, and uh, those were not great K-State teams, even though there was some serious talent on them. Um, but, like, he had to learn. Even though he had the flashes, there were a lot more negatives during that first year for, for Josh Freeman and that K-State team. And it would be the same thing here where, I mean, maybe it wouldn't be, but it just based off what we've seen in history, it's very rare for the, the very, very young guys to come in and just put in the – the amount of talent they have, it's tough to match that with success early on. Now you kind of the, bounce back and forth with those. Look at the best quarterbacks in the country right now. I mean, Quinn Ewers didn't play one snap his freshman year in Ohio yeah. State. I don't believe he just wasn't ready from a mental standpoint. First year at Texas last year, still very shaky. And now, you know, Texas doesn't lose a game this year that he might be the Heisman Trophy winner. Caleb Williams, even his first year at Oklahoma, he had some rocky moments. Remember, Oklahoma almost lost at Kansas that year. Yeah. With Caleb Williams at quarterback. Spencer Rattler, a very disastrous couple first couple of years at Oklahoma. Now he's starting to get a footing a little bit at South Carolina, where you're seeing him take off with some better numbers. No one know who no one knew who Michael Penix was two or three years ago. He was at Indiana, and I think they had a really good COVID year, and then he was terrible did, the following yeah. season. So you get you just never know. And First years for a quarterback tend to be problematic. You're seeing it with Kate Klubnick. He's really talented. Now he's probably hampered by the system at this point, even though he's mm -hmm. playing for Garrett Riley. Now, same thing. Um, I mean, Will you know, Howard is the like is the perfect example of that. Like, like yeah, I mean, just, first you're going to go through growing pains. It's do you, but it'd be better for Kansas State to have him get his feet wet this year take away some of those growing pains because mm -hmm. then he gets an entire off season and is ready to go next year. And you kind of alleviate some of the uh, fire by trial, so to speak, that some of these other programs have had to endure with the, you know, the rookie quarterback, so to speak, especially when you got a guy that's still able to go out there and win a big 12 title already in Will Howard. And it kind of goes to our next piece. Cause I said, I'm a little bit worried about the defense because we just saw that lack of experience cost them will contribute to costing them a game on the road to Missouri. Maybe it looks better at home. It typically does um, from a communication standpoint, although defensively um, home games are when it's the loudest when you're on defense. Yeah. So that's something to consider, but we thought I, well, I can tell you inexperience is what cost them on the defensive side of the ball last week. It's only getting worse now. And now, that doesn't mean that these guys can't have a good game or fix it in a week. Maybe they can. I haven't really seen it completely disappear in a week, but maybe they can. Um, but now you're playing an offense in UCF that is pretty complicated, has a lot of creative things, angles, misdirections, motions. Gus Malzahn really known for that type of stuff. And you've added more in experience because gone is Daniel Green and in as a true freshman. Yeah, I mean that's it's well said, and it's 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 all things to consider. Now, 
We'll we'll continue on with this, you know, emphasis on the quarterback and the situation there real quick before we we finish up. Say that that Will Howard is able to play this weekend. You know, we don't know one way or the other. The the wording was questionable from Chris Kleiman. So say he is able to play, but obviously he's not going to be at 100%, even if he is playing. Even if he could play the entire game, he's not at 100%. So what is the ideal split between him and Avery Johnson and how would you how would you try to use that situation? I mean, this is the team is in your hands. Chris Kleiman does not exist. Derek Young is the head coach at Kansas State. How are you splitting these guys up this weekend? Oh, Kansas State's in trouble if that's the case. <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm if Will Howard's good enough to go, he's going. He's going until he can't go. If he's good enough to go, I don't especially with the bye week the following week. That's another reason why maybe it's worth throwing him out there because it's not necessarily something that's going to cost him a season. It's not what he's dealing with. So it's more of a pain tolerance issue that can get better in time. And you're about to have two weeks of, of rest. So do they take advantage of that and toss him out there? You know, hadn't thought about that until I just brought it up. Good angle to think about. I would, yeah, Will Howard would be my guy. I would use it similarly to what they did last week against Missouri. I thought that was the right way to go. Now, it I would modify it a little bit, like what have I what I've already shared in that, <laughs> excuse me. I wouldn't be afraid to keep Avery Johnson on the field if he gives me back to back good plays or or a really good run. I wouldn't take him out. Maybe I would once it gets the first down, get get Will Howard in there. The thing is, I wouldn't like Will Howard on the same on the field at the same time as Avery either. But does the, then do your shuffling on and off? Does that disrupt things? It's hard. Uh, two quarterback systems are difficult to navigate, and not having Will leave the field, maybe that's a way for them to navigate it. I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's because when you need the quarterback run game, you need Avery. Yeah. No. It, and honestly, I mean, after what we we've seen the first three weeks. It almost feels like if you want the run game at all, you need Avery right now. It's not just the quarterback run game. I mean, he is the quarterback running, but you need the quarterback running for the to successfully run the ball right now if you're K-State. Uh, and maybe getting Christian Duffy back helps alleviate some of those problems a little bit this week, um, but obviously he's still going to be limited. So it's going to be fascinating seeing how K-State manages everything that goes with this weekend because – I mean, coming off that loss, now every conference game is important and must win, but you certainly cannot, if you're K-State, back up the loss to Missouri with a home loss to UCF, who is also playing with their backup quarterback. So this is this is a game that even with excuses floating around for K-State, there's still no reason for them to lose this game on Saturday to, to Central Florida. I would agree, and – I just worry about the inexperience on the defensive side of the ball against a little bit of a creative offense. That that does get eliminated a little bit because you are the home team also playing a backup quarterback. But I, I long term, I have some questions about the defense. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the week that you need those guys up front to step up and just the pressure's got to be there from the get go. It can't wait until the first fifteen minutes or twenty minutes in the game have gone by. Uh, like it kind of feels like it has the, the first three games of the season. So we'll see uh, what it brings uh, for the Wildcats this weekend against UCF, 7 o'clock kick against the Knights. Uh, anything midweek that's popped up about UCF that you're you're interested in or a little concerned about for K-State? I mean, you talked about the offense being creative and possibly giving the defense fits. Uh, have you have you done any studying on Timmy McClain, the the quarterback they're trotting out there? We had a UCF fan comment on Monday's show. He didn't like uh, how we talked about uh, Timmy McClain, about how he didn't have a good year at South Florida. I think I said that. Uh, it, that's a fact. He did not have a good year, and he was the quarterback on a bad South Florida team. It, you know, like, he may have not had a ton of the blame, but he played and he was bad on a bad team. Uh, you know, pardon me for asking for a little bit more from Timmy McClain before I, I crown him Florida Jesus, you know, whatever you want him to be down there. Uh, so uh, what, what, any midweek thoughts on UCF? I know we'll have a deeper dive come Friday on, on them. They have a better defense than what meets the eye. 
their offense, it, they're going to be contingent on Gus Malzahn or whoever it be. It, well, I don't know if he calls the game or if he has no C that calls the game. I know it's his offense, um, but they're going to be contingent on preparation and play calling. Um, do they have a good plan? Because they, they got a few dudes, especially a wide receiver that I would that I like. But you're really going into a hornet's nest with a backup quarterback that's not exactly a guy that you can say, let's go win us a game. Yeah. All right. Uh, we, we haven't been able to comment on it since it happened. Uh, K-State fell out of the top 25 uh, after the loss to Missouri. Is that deserved, or should they have hung on at like 24 or 25? Dropping over 10 spots seems a little harsh, does it not? It does, but it's early enough that I don't mind the volatility. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. Everybody be mad at DY because he said K-State doesn't deserve to be in the top 25. Uh, that's Those are exactly his words there. Yeah, no. I – you know what? If they win this week, they'll probably they might be back in. I don't know how close they were to missing it. I'll, I'll be honest, I, and uh, I'll you know take some 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 heat here too. I have no problem with them falling out of the top twenty five. It felt like a bad loss at the time. It just it didn't feel good. They they played they didn't play well on Saturday. Um, I'm not gonna fault anybody too hard for it. But you look around, there are teams that they are better than that are in the top twenty five currently. Uh, they came. They were three spots out of it. Clemson and Missouri got more votes than K State, but both of those were on the outside looking in. Florida was the last team in there, and that's probably deserved. I mean, they beat just beat Tennessee. Um, Missouri's undefeated and beat K State. Yep. Yeah. So you know, we'll see. I mean, yeah. Iowa. I think a bunch of these teams that are on the outside are better than Iowa, but for some reason we have to we have to keep ranking Iowa, even though we we know that they suck. Well, they're they'll, they're bound to lose, but they are three and O's. Getting credit for being three and zero when there's such a small sample size, I don't absolutely hate. It'll probably be corrected over time, especially. I mean, is Iowa State the best team that Iowa's played? Probably they played Western Michigan and somebody else that I can't even put my mind on right now. Um, but but I'll say this: Kansas State wins. Um, Clemson and Missouri are the two teams in front of them just before the top 25 uh clemson missouri are probably i mean i would not be stunned i wouldn't say probably i would not be stunned if both clemson and missouri uh lost this week well weird game for the tigers this week after after their emotional high they uh, what it's an 11 a.m kickoff or is, or is it a night game it's either 11 or 7 it's like the total was, total reverse but they're playing in st louis they are playing yeah. in the loo mizzou to the loo uh, to face Memphis on Saturday, which confused. is just kind of a weird game. I was confused there for a minute because you said Tigers, and I just mentioned Clemson and Missouri. I'm like, oh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Which both, ones? Both teams are Tigers. Uh, Missouri, they're 6.30 <laughs> kickoff against Memphis. So. Now, Clemson does have an 11 a.m. kick, and, and uh, unless – because I was like, man, is he calling the Florida Atlantic game oh. tricky or, or mm, Florida State yeah. game tricky because he played Florida State this week. I would say just, it's, it's probably more than tricky for Clemson. Yeah, um, but interesting, and maybe we'll climb into this more in our preview show, of course. Clemson, only a two-point dog at home against Florida State. Yeah, I mean, you know, probably Florida State uh, folks were scared because they didn't necessarily uh, put away Boston College last weekend. So Maybe, maybe looking ahead, though, and Jordan Travis didn't miss a quarter True. and a half. True. We'll have, to, we'll have to see how it goes. All right, that will do it for DY and I today. We will be back on Friday as we – Put it all together for you, previewing Saturday's matchup between K-State and UCF. We will also go through and have our best bets to look around the rest of the Big 12, but a uh, total deep dive on the Cats and the Knights. We'll see if we have any more clarity on what K-State's situation might look like injury-wise and what we expect uh, in total for the game on Saturday. But that will do it for Derek and I today. You can get all the K-State content that you need and deserve over at kstateonline.com as well as right here on the k-state online youtube and podcast platforms so make sure you're subscribed anywhere and everywhere that you can get kso and uh, we'll continue to bring you the coverage that you want and uh, hopefully keeps you in the know on the wildcats as they get ready to start big 12 play nine games left in the regular season 25 percent of the season gone by already dy 
Uh, that's the math on this weekend's game. It'll be 33% of the season gone by after this weekend. So, you know, a, a third of the games will have been played already. You and your math. Yep, that's, a, that's about the extent of it. Uh, my math grades at K-State were not very good, but what I learned, what I learned in all that – there are a lot of there are a lot of people that are way dumber than me in this world because I got some really helpful grades thanks to the curve. So if you were one of my classmates at K-State and in my math class and you had a worse grade than me, thank you for being an idiot. I appreciate it. My degree does as well. And you better you better look up what five out of twelve is for next week. Uh, no, uh, percentages are, are done until we get to game six. So there you go. <laughs> 